welcome everybody and thanks for being here. And so we're gonna do a, a deep dive into preprints and, and open access. Um, I'm Brian Cook, I'm at the University of Virginia and um, I, what's my, I am the, the co-chair of the moderation committee for uh, Ed Archive and I've been involved in with Ed Archive, which is a uh, preprint server uh, for education. So I'll talk a little bit about that and we'll talk about other uh, issues related to, to preprints and, and open access. Um, and, and I'll just, before I forget, throw out a, a quick, even though we can't see your faces, I, I think you can make comments or raise hands and, and things that we'd encourage you to, to chime in. If you have questions, comments, you know, would, would like us to expand on, on something that, that we want to make this as uh, relevant as possible for you. So, so feel free at any time to um, uh, bump in and, and uh, give us some input on. Yeah, on and I can monitor the chat and, and sort of interject, but I'll also say, hi, I'm Stacy. Um, I'm a assistant faculty member in learning sciences and psychology at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. I'm also part of the Ed Archive Steering Committee and I think my role is like liaison to the Center of Open Science. So um, I'm relatively new to the land of preprints, um, but I am a huge fan of open access. And so I'm really excited to be here today with Brian and we're gonna go over um, a couple of different things and sort of trade off talking, but please let us know if you have questions, want us to talk about something in more detail or more depth. And if I think if we don't have the answer to your question, we can always try and um, follow up with you later. Um, but let me just, I can go ahead and start the slide deck. So today's agenda, I'm gonna start us off uh, talking about open access. What that is, the rationale, um, publishing open access and some of these um, open access FAQs. Uh, then we'll move to preprints, talking about the rationale, benefits, limitations. And then like Brian said, we'll, we'll sort of walk you through um, Ed Archive. Um, so just to sort of jump us off open access. Um, open access, the rationale for this is um, several lines of thinking really. Um, so the idea here is that you wanna make your work open and available to the public you work hard as researchers or um, writers or, or whatever it is, right? You wanna make your work known and disseminate it as broadly as possible. Open access is a way to help do that. Um, having open access promotes scientific literacy. I was just talking to someone in um, another session who said that they were in Ethiopia and no one has access to scientific literature over there because there's no library access. Um, the publishing model usually makes it really hard to buy articles or buy access. And so by sort of adopting open access uh, practices, you can make your, your work more widely available, promoting scientific literacy. Um, also, a lot of people think this is the ethical way to disseminate work. And what I really mean by that is that researchers don't get paid to publish and reviewers don't get paid to review. Also, taxpayers largely front the bill um, for the research we do from our governments or um, other sort of uh, organizations. And so it's kind of unfair to the taxpayer that their tax dollars go to funding us, our work. Um, and we sort of, you know, are in the process of creating not knowledge, but then they are charged uh, again, to access that knowledge. So a lot of times when we think about open access, we're really thinking it's really ethical dissemination, right? We don't want to make people pay twice. Um, Brian, can you explain what these various levels mean? Yeah, I think this came out of um, Pivovar, and I'm guessing I'm saying that right, but I may not be, um, did a, um, <clears throat> and colleagues did a, a very large review uh, of open access publishing across different disciplines in, in science in 2018. Um, sometimes there's an additional uh, category, but these are kind of the traditional categories uh, of open access. So some would, would posit a, a kind of top category that's sometimes called diamond or platinum open access and that OA abbreviation is, is open access. Um, but I'll start with gold and, and then go back up. So, uh, Gold is when a, an entire journal is open access. So within the field of, of education, for example, there is open AERA and everything uh, on that journal is, is uh, freely uh, accessible by everyone if you can get on the internet. And so there's, there's really no option to it. If you're gonna publish there, it's going to be open access, which sounds wonderful. 
um, great, I'll publish open access then. Well, open access is uh, still, the, the, they need to uh, support the, the journal, pay the bills, um, and um, there are some uh, gold open access journals that are, are trying to turn a profit as well. And so instead of uh, having people pay to access the, the publications because they're behind a paywall and people need to have a subscription or pay individually for them, they charge um, the authors an APC or an uh, article processing charge. And those range very broadly. Um, I did a, a study looking at in my field of special education, uh, we looked at journal policies and the APCs varied. Uh, they tended to be around $3,000 per article. So they are not trivial. In, um, in the news recently, uh, Nature, uh, uh, which is owned by Springer, uh, has now, they're, they're developing some, some gold uh, option, uh, journal options, and they are charging 9,500 euros or uh, I think a little over $11,000 per article, which is, raises a whole other issue or dimension of, of open access publishing. So that ethical issue that, that Stacy talked about that um, you know, we want to make our, our, our scholarship and our research as, as accessible and, and open as possible in terms of dissemination. But does this then limit who can publish in certain outlets and these gold uh, outlets by who can afford to pay uh, APCs? And we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, so uh, above, it isn't on here, but I want to mention the um, diamond or platinum open access is when uh, journals do not charge authors. So things are, uh, the, the publications are open access, but there's no APC for them. There's no article processing charge. Those tend to be um, small scale journals that are run maybe by a professional organization and they just have volunteers running a, a website and are more just kind of posting PDFs uh, and, and probably have a, just a volunteer um, set of reviewers and, and editorial board members. Uh, and, and so those do exist. They tend not to be um, very large, high profile journals, uh, but they, they certainly do exist. Um, we'll talk about green, um, which is essentially anything that's self archived. So preprints are an example of this. And there's different options. Uh, that as authors, we can post versions of, of our own work on different um, sites uh, in different locations on the web. Bronze is, is actually, um, according to Pivovar's uh, work in, in 2018, was the most frequently used type of, of open access. And so bronze is, the work isn't licensed as open access, it is something that the, the journal or the publisher decides to make open access on their own volition. Um, and, and this could be for um, kind hearted reasons because they want to make this a good research and, and scholarship available to the world. But sometimes it is probably because there's a special issue that they want to drive traffic to their journal website uh, or, or for whatever reason, um, but they decide to make things, uh, certain things open access on their on their website. And that may stay open access for some time. It could change tomorrow and, and be back behind a, a paywall. So bronze open access gives us open access, but uh, it isn't licensed, which isn't then it's not clear about how you can use that in, uh, in, in different ways, whether you can freely share that. Um, and it, it may cease to be open access very soon. Hybrid is becoming more and more popular, whereas a gold open access journal is the entire journal is, is open access. Hybrid is where authors have the option, and I see this more and more frequently uh, when uh, something gets accepted for publications, they ask, would you like to make this open access? And I would, but then it also says, well, then you can do that. You can make your article open access, 
Other things in the journal probably won't be in that issue or the journal generally, but you have to pay that APC then, uh, that, that article processing charge. And again, that tends to be in our field about $3,000, uh, but it, it, it varies by journal and by publisher. Um, but uh, this is becoming an option more and more in some of the higher impact, um, high, high prestige journals, and, and, and it can be more expensive. And then closed is, is the, um, it still is probably predominant, roughly probably 50% um, in, in PIVAVAR's survey across disciplines, about 50% of uh, published uh, articles were just not available unless you uh, were affiliated with an institution that, that's uh, paid for a contract or that uh, you choose to, to pay individually for access to an article. And they're getting quite creative, the publishers are getting quite creative about how to do that. I see more and more like for 24 hours of access, only $25 or something, mm -hmm. um, which is, I, 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 I think as, as, as uh, Stacy mentioned, is just a real shame that um, we have large, oftentimes publicly funded uh, research that we can't access without paying for. Mm -hmm. Oh, and so here is, the, I, I've referred to it a couple times. This is a, a figure from the PIVAVAR um, review. And so this shows it, it is, it's getting better. There's more and more of these different options being done. And this is a few years old now. I would suspect that these trends are, are continuing in the same direction. Um, but even in the more recent years, we see the majority of research is, is still closed with at any given time, there's a fair amount of uh, material that is bronze access, some hybrid, more and more gold. And uh, I, I would imagine green is, is increasing uh, in, in the most recent years more and more too. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people have questions about open access because we wanna make our work available, but like Brian just sort of laid out, like it's complicated, right? Like. A lot of times to get that, you know, your work out, if you go through a specific journal, you are going to have to pay an article processing charge of $3,000 to $11,000. Um, the lowest I've ever seen, I think, is $700. Um, but it gets quite complicated. So a lot of people try and find uh, workarounds or ways that they can sort of identify the journals that are the most encouraging of open access. And so um, one of the most frequently asked questions is how do you find these open access journals and articles? Uh, we all want the diamond one, right? Like we all want the one that's not going to charge us. It's not going to charge the, um, the reader. It's just going to make it available. But sometimes that's not always an option. So we want to see what our options are. So um, one really helpful resource here um, is the directory of open access journals. Many of you have probably heard about this, um, but what this is, is it's a directory of open access journals. You go in, you can uh, search by subject um, or title. There's a lot of different filters you can put on and off, like, you know, does the journal require an article processing charge? Does it not? Um, and this is a really great way to sort of find where you can publish your work in a way um, that makes it the most open open access as possible. Um, another question we usually get is, um, uh, oh, wait, Brian, did you add this one? I, I did. I snuck. I don't know this. <laughs> this is surprising. Please share. I, I snuck in a slide on you. So uh, <laughs> this is a um, kind of the, the counterpart to uh, looking for open access journals. This is looking for specific articles that may be open access. Mm. And so this is something um, developed uh, and they, they just search a, a whole bunch of different repositories for you. And so if you have an, an article name or a DOI, uh, you just put it in and they search it for you. If they can't find it anywhere, they actually have something that they'll set up. You can email or you can contact the author. Um, I'm assuming through the author's contact information from the article. To, to request the article from them, which is always an option, which is a, you know, a, a very good option. We do have on an individual basis, you can uh, send your uh, article uh, formatted, you know, a PDF of the formatted article to people individually. Um, oftentimes though, if you sign the, the copyright with a journal, you can't do that and just post it up any, any, anywhere on the internet but you can send it individually to folks. So that's always an option. But um, I, I wasn't aware of this open access button until recently. I have reason to believe it is not 100% uh, exhaustive. 
So there are things that didn't come back on the open access button that I've done searches uh, just through Google. And you know, if, I, if I look around enough, I sometimes I can find a version of it uh, around too. And uh, then as uh, Sherry points out, there's also the uh, unpaywall uh, option that, that's out there. Yeah, so just to clarify, Brian, is this open access button a plugin as well? To like, I believe it is. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, I can't wait to <laughs> can't wait to play with it. Yeah, but like as Brian mentioned, one thing that's really helpful, and I think if you're an instructor or deal with any students, to recommend is if they can't access an article, don't ever pay. Try and email the author or look at the author's website. A lot of times, I found um, that works really well. Oh, thanks for sharing. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so other questions people ask, is there funding for open access author fees, right? These APCs can be a lot of money. What sort of funding is around for them? Um, usually it's pretty limited. Um, so a lot of times you can write them into grants. If you're trying to get um, mm -hmm. funding for your research, you can say, I need X amount of money for article processing charges to make this open and available. Sometimes universities have funds um, specifically for this, but not all universities. Um, some journals have reduced APCs for students and authors based in countries classified as low income economies. Um, there's a couple other sort of nuances, Brian. I don't know if you want to add anything to this. Oh, I, I don't. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, but with the a lot of the APCs have kind of a graduated. They'll have um, adjusted rates um, depending on kind of career status and um, country that that your uh, that the university is is based in. So sometimes the the APCs aren't as as expensive, um, but for journals that, that require APCs to, to make them open, that is, is generally a, an, an unfortunate requirement there. There is, I, I, I think, a growing um, blowback to the, the APCs, and, and as they seem to be growing higher and higher, it, it is almost just a transferring of the the cost and and we don't have time to to get into it and i'll get all upset about it too but when you look at the um you look at the profit margins of the publishers that it, it it's just remarkable and um so the, the the people to to charge the people that are reviewing the articles that are writing the articles that are conducting the articles the to then charge them to publish it um, you know, a, a much bigger picture that, that we're not going to go into here, but uh, you know, there, there is, I, I think, a movement to kind of just blow up this system and, and think about um, doing publishing in, in a very different way that is, is separate from the kind of traditional journal structure that, that's been around for, for quite a while now, but may not be necessary. Um, Right. I wish we had more time to talk about that because there have been some new interesting models like collaborative psychology, charging at cost, but waiving APCs for like graduate researchers or early career paying like reviewers. Like there's a lot of new models sort of happening around. But I think for by and large, most of the time when you're talking about open access, someone's going to try and charge you an APC. OK, let's just pretend you can't afford the APC, but this is the best journal for your work go ahead and publish in them, but how can you still, even if you can't afford to make it open access for everyone, how can you still sort of make your work more open access for people, right? So if you can't do it through the journal, through the cost, there are other workarounds. So let's talk about some of those. Um, one thing I think is really helpful is ResearchGate or academia.edu, uh, whatever you, uh, you fancy in terms of research sharing. A lot of times you can post articles under your profile as a researcher um, and store the text privately. And so um, like one journal I had said, you can send 50 free copies or whatever to people, or if it's for uh, teaching or instruction purposes, like it's unlimited. And I would just hold um, a uh, sort of a private text. And then every time someone would hit that request button, boom, I'd approve it and it would shoot them out um, a copy of the article. So that's that's one way to sort of uh, help make your work more open. Another is you can check uh, Sherpa Romeo, which is a wonderful website. 
that will basically allow you to look up the journal you're publishing in and see what you can post. Um, and we're going to talk about preprints in just a second, but this is a great website to see sort of what can I get away with legally um, in terms of posting the work that I've done on this article. So um, if you go to Sherpa Romeo, this is the front page, you can type in the journal title or the ISSN, and then it will show you what the policy of the journal is. Um, so here you have the published version. So for this this particular journal, it, you can post to any website, the journal website, et cetera. Um, so this is the publisher's PDF. They formatted it, it's very beautiful. That's, that's the published version. You also have the accepted version. So this is probably still that Microsoft or um, Latex document, but it's gone through peer review, but it's the accepted, right? All the material, all the words are the same. Um, and this accepted version, according to this website, could be posted on archive, bioarchive, social archive, and a couple others. Um, there's this one, I can't remember what the difference is, accepted version pathway B. I think, oh, this one for institutional repository or specific ones, um, you need a, you have an embargo of like 18 months. Um, so there's just a lot of information here on what you can post and sort of where, but the submitted version, which is what we typically think of as the preprint before peer review, um, there's no embargo. You can pretty much post it to any of the preprint servers. So this website is a really great way to say like, hey, this journal's policies are you can post this version of your article in these different places. Stacy, can I uh, just to tag on a second there? Um, I'll, I'll highlight that embargo, and it, it, it's here with a little um, hourglass and talking about time. That it, it, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but as as you start to wade into some of the nitty gritty kind of legalistic elements of what can I do and what can I not do? It, it isn't, it is, it is oftentimes a chore to figure that out for any particular journal. Um, I, I, I wish there was greater clarity. You could just go on the journal website and oh, here are our policies about open access, but usually you have to really search through their website. And then oftentimes that takes you to uh, there's a link that goes to the publisher website, and then you have to go through three more links there to go, and, and it can be uh, difficult. Um, I, I encourage people to, if they're not sure, if they can't figure it out, email the, the journal editor or the, the, um, the, the, the assistant for the, the journal. Um, oftentimes they're not entirely sure of all of these policies too. But anyway, one of the issues is that for certain things, you can do them, certain things you can't, and certain things you can do after an embargo period. And so, mm -hmm. um, for example, you could post the accepted version. And so that's not the, the fancy journal formatted piece, just like Stacy said, this is probably a PDF of your Word document, but it has um, elements of peer review that have been incorporated into it. And so the journal does have some say over what you can do with that because it's gone through their peer review and you've incorporated uh, elements of that into the manuscript. But uh, very oftentimes you are allowed to post that. Um, and, and so here you can post that on a preprint archive at any point and you can post it on um, different um, institutional repositories, for example, but only after 18 months after publication, which and this is, I, I'm not sure if there is a rhyme or reason to it. And it, the, the policies really vary across different publishers and journals. So it, it, it's hard to just say, and this is the generally what happens. The submitted version where this is what you submitted. It was, it, it's a probably a PDF of your Word document. It mm -hmm. hasn't been submitted yet that you can pretty much do whatever you want with. Right, because it's 100% you. You haven't like dependent on peer review right. or anything like that. Right. Oh, the, also, oh, good. Oh, I was gonna say, but there are, there is a rare exception where some journals will not accept um, submissions that have been pre-printed. It is, it is fairly rare. I think it is uh, very seldom policed, but um, there are some journals, I'm not sure of the rationale, but there are some journals that it is at least their policy not to um, accept submissions for 
uh, pre-printed articles. So in that case, if you posted yours, the, the submitted version, you, you, it's your right to do that legally. It may, however, you wanna make sure that the journal or journals that you may be targeting don't have a policy that then um, prevents you from submitting there. Right, yeah, that's a good point. And we'll, we'll talk more about this. One thing I wanted to add though, talk to your librarian if you're not sure. I learned way too late as a graduate student at UCLA that the entire UC system, because I was like affiliated with them, had all of these rights that I had no idea. So like I could literally sign my firstborn away um, by giving my publisher or my PDF to a journal. And they're like, we own this, we own you, whatever. But because I was affiliated with the UC system, I actually had rights to upload that into their own repository. So there's like a lot of layers here that are difficult to navigate. But this is definitely one resource I think that, that could be helpful, but also your local librarians, they might know things um, that are specific to you and your institution that are really helpful. It's a good point. And you see the UC's University of California have a, a very interesting history and um, recent history with, with negotiating with publishers and do have some unique uh, arrangements yeah. with, with uh, publishers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so here's just some more. Um, but let's talk about preprints. Um, so this is sort of like where we're going to go from here. So preprints, we're going to talk about what they are, the different terms that get thrown around, why we need them, the benefits, the limitations, sort of how they're growing, if they're reliable or not, and sort of how they relate to repositories. Uh, and then Brian is going to take us through the Ed Archive, posting the consuming, and then we'll do like questions and answers. Okay, so some terminology. So we talked about this a little bit. A preprint is the most common term, I think, um, but it's used in a different and potentially confusing way. So sometimes people call these white papers. Sometimes they're referred to as preprints. Uh, I think the open science community has pretty much adopted the term as preprints, but there's a couple different ways of um, of sort of terms that get thrown around. So specifically, the preprint is. Um, the print that's posted to a repository before edits are made reflecting peer review from a journal. Um, and uh, to refer generally to both pre and post. So if you have a preprint, it's like what you wrote with your team or yourself or whatever. Um, and if it gets posted, it's con it's considered like a preprint. It hasn't been printed by a publisher. It hasn't even gone through peer review. Um, a post print, is um, the print that's posted to a repository after edits are made reflecting peer review from a journal. Um, hey, Marcy. Uh, so basically uh, what this is, is like it's gone through peer review, uh, but it's not the publisher's PDF version, right? Um, and then lastly, this print is sometimes used to refer to generally just both preprints and postprints. Uh, so it gets a little bit confusing, but the idea here is that the preprint is before peer review and the postprint is usually after peer review. Brian, did I get that right? I, I think that's right. The only thing think. <laughs> to, to, to try to make it even more confusing is that I think oftentimes, this is the, the kind of the sub bullet there mentioned, preprint is often used kind of generically and. Um, probably technically incorrectly, but kind of people will refer to this kind of universe of, of print postings as, as preprints. And technically the, the preprint probably you know, should mean um, just if it hasn't been submitted yet. But um, mm -hmm. oftentimes I think people just think about all it of these things a little as preprint. Yeah. So when you hear preprint, it, it's just, it's, it's probably not clear what, what exactly um, is being referred to unless you, you ask. Want to walk us through this? Yeah, sure. Uh, so lots of rationales for doing this that overlap uh, significantly with uh, the, the rationales for, for making work open access that, that Stacy talked about earlier. And so a lot of it is just, we want to make our stuff freely accessible for everybody and to democratize access to um, research and, and the knowledge base. Um, in terms of, uh, for the, the researcher, there is research uh, to show that uh, making your work open access and in particular green access uh, increases impact. And I think that only stands to reason you're making it available to a whole new and, and broader range of, of uh, researcher or other researchers and, and research consumers. Uh, so it, it can really extend uh, the impact, especially I think to non-researchers 
we're probably less likely to have those institution, institutional affiliations. Um, and, and so that, that's reflected, that increased impact is, is reflected in, in documented higher citation rates for, for preprints. Um, certainly combating publication bias where, um, you know, I guess it isn't, the file drawer analogy doesn't work quite as well in our, our digital age, but the idea that, that uh, we, we just keep a lot of these studies with null effects uh, don't get published. They're just kind of on people's hard drives or in their file drawers. This allows us, and there's actually been initiatives in other fields to try to empty the file drawer and get all of these uh, unpublished, uh, all that unpublished gray literature out there and available for people to search. So when you post to, to uh, a, a print archive, for example, it gets a DOI and, and it turns up in Google Scholar searches and things like that. So we can really make a, a, a big uh, fruitful push for uh, trying to flesh out the, the research base um, for things that, that might not be published because of the, the findings were insignificant or small or not interesting enough to, to make it into a journal. Um, and so that's the, the next bullet point there. Um, making research available more quickly. This has really made headlines and, and has become a, a bigger and bigger issue um, with the, the pandemic that in uh, the hard sciences, getting information about um, uh, COVID and the COVID studies out tomorrow is saves lives as opposed to waiting for months of, of peer review. And in the worst case, well, I don't know if I should say worst case, but in the extreme case, uh, you know, peer review, articles sometimes go through multiple rounds of peer review at multiple journals. And even within a single journal, I've had things that are in peer review for over a year. And so there are you know, stories certainly that I've heard of, of things being in, in going through peer review for multiple years. And, and so if this is a, a timely matter, getting that out, peer review obviously has a lot of strengths, but uh, it takes a lot of time. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. That obviously brings up huge issues that these prints have not necessarily been peer reviewed, but it, it gets it out there much more quickly. It can be a mechanism for feedback that uh, people can comment on work before you submit it for uh, peer review for publication. And so you can put it out there, invite people to look at it, uh, or, or just have uh, it, it's out there for people to comment on. So you can get feedback uh, for, for people to, to look at it. It's also um, a, a nice thing if you have, say you're on the job market or something like that. And instead of saying, oh yeah, look at my CV, I list a whole bunch of in- uh, in, in, in process perhaps. papers or yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so here you can actually have here's a here's a DOI where you can look at some of my work that that is currently under review uh, and, and have that available for folks yeah. and just to jump in I remember like one tweet Brian Nosek had was like this article just got published and it already has 17 citations because we published this as a preprint. And so people were already like using the knowledge in their own work and referencing that in their own work. So that by the time it was published, it was already being used, which I thought was really cool. Right, which in, in kind of my view of how the, the publishing can be a nice kind of megaphone for work, but it, I, 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 I like the idea of having a separate system for disseminating it and making, avail making it available mm -hmm. and people can use it regardless of, of whether a publisher picks it up or not. Um, you can also, there aren't uh, page limits, which most journals have uh, associated with preprint archives. So you wanna add extra material, expand on your method. Um, you can put it out there, uh, have that extended uh, unabridged version on a uh, on an archive or, or in a preprint, which, which I think is just fantastic. And I don't know how this bullet around the the file drawer I put at the end because I already talked about that uh, related to, to publication. Yeah, and I think that it ties into the slide. Someone wrote, "When you post an empirical report on a preprint journal with no intention of submitting it to a journal for peer review, what's that called? Not really a preprint. Has the term been developed yet to signal that a paper is a terminal preprint?" And I love this because, again, that idea of the file drawer, like we spend time, energy, uh, if you're in human subjects, other people's time working and trying to collect data and for it to just sit there and never see the light of day is sort of like a huge disservice to all that time, energy and resources. And so um, I've, I've had people who are like, 
the study like fell apart. It doesn't have the findings to get published. What do I do? And I'd be like, just write it up as a preprint, write it up as a preprint, post it there. You'll have a DOI. People can find it, right? It's, it's allowing people to find the work who are interested in the topic. And, you know, it doesn't have the same impact on the CV as a published article, but at least you're disseminating the work in a way that is open access. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Great point, Sherry. You can put those terminal preprints in your local institutions repository. Yeah, exactly. Um, another thing too is um, we're seeing some shifts in the field. So uh, the uh, journal eLife recently changed their model to a preprint first model. So basically this journal found after looking at uh, who was applying to the journal and what was getting published, like 90 something percent of the people had been posting preprints ahead of time. And so they thought, well, this is where the field's going. We're just gonna require this. So with this, uh, this journal, they actually want you to and require you to post your work ahead of time, perhaps get feedback, have it open, and then you could take that preprint and apply to the journals. And I've seen a lot of energy behind um, people wishing that all journals would just accept preprints as submissions. So you don't have to like, format it and do all these other things for, you know, specific to the journal, but you could really just like post your preprint and then use that as submission. Um, so I think there's a little bit of momentum here, uh, which I really encourage, um, but it has yet to be widely adopted to my knowledge. Yeah. And in, in education, I don't, um, I, I don't think it's been adopted in particular, but I do that, that idea of kind of blowing up the process a little bit. This is maybe one way to do that. And so mm -hmm. Um, publishing really then becomes just making it public and, and we make all of our work public and we have these um, print repositories where everybody's work is out there for everybody to comment on. Um, but that then uh, journals then kind of can select and, and curate uh, different works from that uh, list that are available and, and in some ways maybe give, give them an, a, an additional megaphone, but it, 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 it obviates the, the journal as the, the, the nexus of, of uh, dissemination of scholarship, which I, I think is a, a real positive develop, potential development. Yeah, I think a lot of researchers would love the ability to just make their work with the <laughs> click of a button available to everyone, right? Instead of waiting years for peer review and to get solicited by journals. That would be amazing. Um, so I hope that is a direction we're moving towards. Uh, it's, this is from um, PIVAVAR's uh, review and, and um, I, I referred to it a, a couple of times in this. So, so this is citation. There are other works that show um, uh, other, uh, a, an, an open uh, access advantage uh, in terms of like um, the, What's, what's the social media uh, impact on blanking in the name of, um, but they have one, um, how often, um, oh, alt, alt metrics. Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, hi, Wendy. Um, and uh, so, but this is just for citations. And so, uh, you know, on average citations get cited a little less than the bronze. There's actually a really interest, there's a piece, God, was that in AERA open, but, um, uh, a year or two ago, AERA just had a, a, a mishap with things and they made a, a couple entire journals just open for a short period of time, bronze open, and they showed uh, a real bump in terms of uh, their downloads, which kind of makes sense. You can download them for free. And so it just kind of shows if you make these open, people are going to come get them and, and use them more. Hybrid is really up there. Green is really up there in terms of making these things. I, I would suspect, suspect some of this is selection bias. People probably are making, uh, choosing to make uh, green versions of their uh, work that is probably going to have some greater access, maybe, or um, greater impact and probably be cited more. They may be more motivated to do that with that work. So that might be uh, behind some of why people are choosing to, yeah, I'm gonna pay for that piece to, to be open access. It's gonna, it might be uh, cited more anyway, but it was, I, I always found this uh, curious that there is a, a lower rate for the gold. And I think some of this goes back to uh, the, the point I'd mentioned earlier about a lot of the gold journals are, are actually kind of small journals uh, that are associated with, with small organizations 
that are just run by the volunteers and, and they're just going to kind of be low, uh, lower sighted uh, because of the nature of, of, of the journal. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm glancing at the chat box. I guess I should pay attention. To we have a great I'm question, but I was hoping to hold it off till the end because it's okay. gonna spark a larger debate, which is an important one. Perfect. Um, I wanna uh, talk, this, so some of the disadvantages, some of the challenges, um, it's not peer reviewed, uh, prints aren't peer reviewed. And, and so I, I'm involved with Ed Archive and we just make sure there aren't <laughs> the, that the content is moderately appropriate. You know, we've run across a couple where that's not the case, but you know, we're not going in and say, oh, was that adequately powered? And uh, they didn't list that as a limitation. And I think they really should have. There's none of that. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, that's not the job. On one hand, I think there's a caveat emptor and, and uh, that's maybe that's okay as long as you realize that. But I'll, I'll talk about some, uh, maybe some other uh, approaches to dealing with it. But that's a huge issue and limitation to this, that, that um, the, the prints, the, the preprints aren't uh, peer reviewed yet. Um, some, as I mentioned, as we mentioned, some journals policies don't allow for submission of preprinted manuscripts. I think that is uh, not too many, but it does happen. And it's, it's, it's important to be aware, uh, uh, make sure when you're thinking about uh, posting a preprint that you're not gonna then target a journal that, that won't accept your submission. Mm -hmm. um, so you can check journal policies um, there. And um, e even though the journal policies on the websites themselves aren't, aren't always clear. One other thing that, that I, I personally, um, I, I'm doing a lot of work actually right now in the, in the area of open science. And in my little world of special education, there is a limited pool of, of people that are going to review works on open science. And at least uh, some of those people um, are I'm connected with on social media. And so if, if I post something on, uh, on Ed Archive and say, hey, I just, we just finished this, go read it. And I put it on Twitter and Facebook and great people go read that. Then I'm worried though, that um, when they get invited to review the piece, they, they have to say, no, I've already read that. I know who the author is. And so I, I actually oftentimes wait till uh, the, the first round or, or after peer review is done and wait till something's accepted, which is a shame. I think for people in broader, who are, who are doing broader work and there's going to be no shortage of uh, potential peer reviewers, then, then maybe that's less of a worry. Um, I, I, I'd like to, to, to see us maybe, well, I don't know. There, there are different thoughts on whether uh, peer review absolutely needs to be blinded in terms of, of knowing the author, but uh, that, that's another uh, issue to, to think about. Definitely. Yeah, Matthias, I, I I tend to be the the same. I'm I'm I think I'm okay with with open peer review, but I know there are pros and cons and different um, thoughts on that. Um, and and so part of this this is a, a the I, I think um, being aware of the limitations um, are is an increasingly important uh, issue as as we start to look at just the um, you can go ahead uh, just the the number of uh, green open access and preprints. Is, is, is starting to really explode in different fields. Um, biology, for example, physics has been that way for a long time. And I, I think we're growing in, in education. And, and so um, hope our, I don't think our, we did one specific to education, it wouldn't quite look like this, but uh, w w I think we're moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. All right, so this gets to be um, kind of the reliability of the preprints then. And this starts to speak to that issue. Well, they're not peer reviewed. Actually, a lot of the stuff that's out there as a preprint is peer reviewed. And so it is something that was a preprint. Um, either the journal allows you to, to, to update those, those prints, uh, maybe after an embargo period, uh, maybe right away. Uh, you can also uh, update preprints as, as I'll talk about in, in just a minute. And so when it is accepted, when it is published, 
you can put the updated DOI in, in the, the, the title page of, of the print. You can put a link to the published article. And so, and, and you can actually note uh, areas of, of potential uh, change, but you can certainly clearly indicate whether this has been published or not so people can compare the, the published and unpublished versions. Um, and so this actually, they were looking specifically at COVID in the Gahano et al study. And they found that 68% of the preprints that have been cited around COVID were subsequently published. So they're actually out there and, and, and published uh, and, and have gone through peer review. This is just an early version of that piece. So um, most of the pieces actually do get published and stand up to, to peer review, but some, some don't, and that's important to realize. Um, about 40, 43% of the preprints didn't, set, didn't mention the publication status on the preprint. So we recommend that you go ahead and put, this is, this is under peer review, um, you know, it just takes a few seconds, but it does take some time then to update it when it has been accepted, when there is an elect, uh, a published version of it out there, you can um, put that out there. And so there's, there's more and more uh, reviews and studies starting to be, starting to be done where they uh, compare the published version to the preprint. And so um, in, in this study, 56% had the exact same data and the exact same conclusions, but 15% of the preprints that had been published when they looked at the published version, it had different conclusions. Um, barely at all, uh, just, just this year already in 2022, um, again, looking in, in COVID, the COVID related uh, preprints and, and publications are kind of the hot area they did uh, find that, that uh, between seven and 17% of the pieces had some changes between the preprint and the published article, but the majority of those articles that did have changes, they didn't really affect the, the main conclusions. They were, they were smaller changes. Um, so in some ways, um, and different people have interpreted this as being very supportive of the reliability of the preprint. Look, most of the stuff ends up getting published most of the published stuff isn't meaningfully different, but it also highlights that there is some stuff that doesn't get some stuff, I shouldn't say stuff, some preprints that um, don't get published. And even among those that do, some of the, the preprints or some of the publications, there's a real change from the preprint. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a relatively small proportion, but um, something certainly to, to bear in mind and, and um, recommendations to watermark preprints, to put something in the, the margins that, that clearly identify the preprint and whether it's undergone peer review or not. Yeah, great advice. I just wanna be mindful of time. We have about 12 minutes left. Um, so maybe Brian, you and I can like speed, get through the rest I of these slides. And there's... So fast from here on out. <laughs> now the other uh, stuff actually is, yeah, I, I think we, okay. can, we can go yeah. real quick. Okay, um, so there's lots of uh, archives out there. Some of them are general or multidisciplinary that education folks can post to. Then there are some that are uh, domain specific. Sci Archive used to be a big one for educational researchers to post to, um, but um, we've been going for two years now. We have Ed Archive, which is an archive specific to uh, educational research. Um, and, and a lot of them are hosted on OSF. So a little bit about Ed Archive, up to 931 preprints posted, probably more because that was a day or two ago. Um, and so to, to post on it, it is actually, I, I'm not gonna go through these for the interest of time and two, because you don't need to. I mean, you, you go to the website, you click on submit a preprint. You, um, I, I can do this without a tutorial. And I'm not good at this type of thing. So um, it, it, is, it is pretty darn self-explanatory. <laughs> uh, from a, a consumer uh, perspective, you can also search the archives that are on there. Um, they have, uh, OSF has, has built in hypothesis, which allows you to comment on the, on, on the, um, on the print. So there is an element of ongoing uh, peer review and you can download any of the, the uh, posted manuscripts as well. I think we, most of this, there is a- Yeah, so this is just one that I, I was gonna demonstrate. This little I thing is the hypothesis. If you wanted to um, uh, comment on it, you can also um, endorse the work. And so this was one of my advisees had, had made this kind of cool flow chart about how to post a preprint. And because I'm 
was a supportive advisor. I, I uh, <laughs> applauded the, the work there. It also comes with some uh, metadata. What's interesting, this is just the bottom half. I couldn't fit it all in one screen, but you can download it. It also shows that there were two versions and the, uh, mm -hmm. you can um, download the previous version. It shows you uh, when it was uh, su submitted and, and last edited. There are tags that you can um, provide as, as an author, and then it actually gives you citations in the different uh, writing styles. Mm -hmm. so we talked about the flow chart. And that's All the slides already. Chart. Yeah, check it out if you're interested. Mm -hmm. So basically, this is what we'll, we'll wrap it up. This is what we talked about today. I think I have one more thing for you, which is pretty preprints, which I really appreciate. These are made by Brenton Wernick. They are on the open science framework. You could literally Google pretty preprints and they're templates that you can download to make your Microsoft Word document a little bit more pretty, uh, a little bit more fancy if you wanted to up your preprint game. And actually I fooled myself into thinking that the preprints I have on my website were actually the publisher's PDF and accidentally sent them before. Um, so it's just, a, yeah, it's a really fun, great way uh, to kind of make your preprints a little bit more polished, a little bit more fun to distribute to others. Um, and I highly, highly recommend it. And we, I think that's it. So uh, thank you, Brian, uh, for helping us walk through this. We had some really good questions in the chat. So I just wanna um, sort of start with uh, a question posed by Yvonne, which was, um, what are your thoughts about the need to educate the general audience about what preprints are? For instance, it's not always easy for media to understand the differences between preprints and reviewed articles. Um, I might start by saying, I don't know if Brian's frozen. I might start by saying there is a huge problem when it comes to dissemination of scientific research uh, by media, just in general, even for things that are peer reviewed. Um, but when it comes to preprints, yeah, it's a little bit more tricky because um, people might treat them with the same like level of uh, rigor as uh, peer reviewed, whether that's true or not, I'm not sure. Um, but it is a little bit challenging um, just in general to work with media who really just wants the bottom line, the hype, the headlines, um, and not really caring about the nuance. Um, so Brian, I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah, I don't know if... Um... I know that there is some work being done and, and I'm not gonna do a good job um, describing it because I'll, I'll forget, but how the media is handling this. And it is something that especially has come up with COVID and, and the media oftentimes kind of trips over itself to either not mention anything about peer review or to mention it as kind of discounting it. And, and, and you know, something isn't of high quality because it is or is not peer reviewed. It is just a, a step to try to uh, promote and, and serve as a gatekeeper for, for quality. But there's plenty of pieces that go through peer review that are then retracted and, and are of low quality. And there's plenty of stuff that isn't published that, that is of high quality. So it's certainly no guarantee one way or the other. I, I, I think just being as transparent as possible and, and uh, about the publication status of it, the peer review status of it, and, um, uh, and and um, being caveat emptor uh, about all of that is, is probably about as, as good as we can do. Um, and, and it's a trade-off between making things, uh, making, our, making work and, and research publicly available, quickly available, but then um, not having peer review. You know, in the, in the, the, the big uh, perfect world, I think we would build peer review into a, a, a print server, a, a, a preprint archive, where we could have ongoing um, review and commentary there. Uh, but but we're not there at, at, at archive yet, and and, and most uh, print servers aren't. That that that'd be quite an undertaking. Yeah, um, there's also a point in the chat from Charlotte who posted a lot of great resources, um, which is have people heard of PCI registered reports, a community driven initiative that facilitates the peer reviews of registered reports via preprints. Uh, you're nodding like you, I have not heard of this. Um, oh, it's, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. And I think Chris Chambers is, um, is spearheading it. Uh, and uh, the idea here is, is registered reports, which is a whole other uh, topic, but uh, doing registered reports works 
largely like dissertations and, and you submit um, just a perspective intro and methods and then that gets accepted in principle. Um, but doing that and, and so they're taking the peer review out of the journal's hands and reviewing these kind of um, study proposals independently that then can be picked up by other journals. And it is, I think, really a kind of first move towards taking uh, the review, the peer review process um, and, and owning it amongst a community of scholars rather than having it being run through and, and for the kind of, uh, to some degree, uh, supporting the profit of, of publishers, uh, even though the, the academics are still doing all the work. That's great. I just want to let everyone know these resources you're adding to the chat, I'm pulling into our slide deck that will be on the open science framework. So the very last slide will include everything that people are sharing. Um, so we won't have time to go over all of it, um, but I do want to make sure that we all um, can access it later. Um, question about Ed Archive. Uh, Brian, have we been in discussions about accepting preprints in other languages besides English? And I think the answer is no, because only Brian and Jesse are reading through all of the preprints on a daily basis. And you're probably at capacity. I, I would have to check, and sorry, this isn't gonna be a satisfactory answer. I, I don't know what our policies are about that. I know I've interpreted pieces using Google um, uh, Translator. And, and I, I kind of think we have accepted pieces that are not in English, but I could be wrong on that. Um, I, I think it's important to do so. Um, it, it's just, we do have kind of a mediator role and we wanna make sure content is appropriate even though we're not peer reviewing per se. So we have to be have some mechanism to figure out what it says, um, but um, I, 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 anyway, I can't, yeah, I can't speak to it without having um, our, our policies in front of it, because I, I, in front of me, because I don't want to misspeak, but I, I, I kind of think we do accept things other than English, but again, I could be very wrong, and if, if so, I apologize. It, it's a good idea. I, I, I think we, we should w within our, our ability to, to do so. Right, and Matthew's saying OSF preprints accepts paper in port Portuguese. So maybe if you can't find the, the subject specific uh, preprint of your field that accepts a different language, maybe there's a more general one like the open yeah. science framework or archive um, that you could still post. You can also do it on your website. So I know um, when I went on the job market, I added all the preprints I could to my website because I knew people were going to be looking at them. And my old work was in transfer students and that wasn't what I was doing, but that was predominantly what I had published. So I made sure to like create my pretty preprints, uh, mark them clearly as preprints and upload them to my website, uh, which I think was really, really helpful when people were trying to Google me. Um, but also I sort of like had control um, of the, the preprint, um, even though it didn't come with the DOI on my own website. It's just another way to sort of use them to my advantage. Yeah, the, the institutional repositories too are something that I yeah. haven't sufficiently explored, but I know a lot of people uh, use and, and uh, feel, feel very positively about that more and more, uh, I, I, almost all, I, I don't know of all, but um, most universities are gonna have an institutional repository where I think you're encouraged to post uh, the, the, the green uh, versions, essentially preprints and um, yeah, I don't, but I should. And it's something I, I, I need to, to probably uh, look into and, and make myself do. Yeah. Well, it's just turned three o'clock. I want to thank you all for coming. If you have any questions, feel free to email Brian or I, or find us, I guess, in one of the, the hangout <laughs> meeting rooms. Um, but I'm sure all y'all want to go see other sessions. So thank you so much for coming. Um, and thanks for the resources you provided. Yes, that was fun. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Stacy. Thank you, Brian. I think oh, I well no. and told you for this. <laughs>